If you look at Wembley Stadium in London, it's 435 feet tall. And if you say I put one drop of water in the stadium the first day and two drops of water the second uh, and four the third and eighth, you know, each day you're doubling the amount of drops. It takes only 48 days to fill the stadium with water. It's kind of amazing. That's the power of compounding. Your journey to wisdom, wealth, and wellness starts here. In this episode, Jonathan speaks with serial entrepreneur, philanthropist, and founder of Tiger 21, Michael Sonnenfeld. Welcome to Wisdom, Wealth, and Wellness. This is Jonathan Satofsky, and today I am blessed and honored to have uh, the esteemed Michael Sonnenfeld, who's I've known for, uh, I guess, a decade or so, and he's the founder uh, and chairman of Tiger 21, a premier premier peer membership organization for high net worth wealth creators and preservers. It's often been called the MBA of life and uh, author of Think Bigger and 39 Other Winning Strategies from Successful Entrepreneurs. He himself is a serial entrepreneur, very successful philanthropist, and political thought leader. Thanks for joining me, Michael. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Great to be here. So we can talk about so many things. You just, um, I'm never, uh, I'm inspired by, by most everything that, uh, that you do, but let's, let's start with Tiger 21 during, during your tenure at Tiger 21. Um, maybe you can give a little background of what is Tiger 21 in a, like a high level view. And, and you've encountered the concept of sudden wealth syndrome amongst your members and how it impacts people psychologically, financially, and maybe you could share some insights and challenges that you've uh, witnessed. Sure. So I've just returned from the North American Chair Conference. What that means is we have groups all around the world of 12 to 15 members, and each group is facilitated by a professional who we call a chair. And these now 100 plus groups meet around the globe every month for a full day. The organization is 24 years old. And um, I've come to realize that there are some extraordinarily great peer-to-peer learning organizations. You may have heard of Vistage or YPO, both cater to CEOs. And when those CEOs sell their business, if they're lucky enough and successful enough, they might graduate to Tiger 21. And I think the best way to understand Tiger is we've been building an organization for 24 years to know more than anybody else about a moment. It's a funny way to think about an organization. But the moment when an entrepreneur, a very successful entrepreneur, sells their business and becomes a wealth preserver, it seems like just a moment, but everything changes in their life. And while not every Tiger member has sold their business, many have significant wealth and some have inherited it, the core of the organization is based on understanding more about that moment and trying to help people navigate sometimes waters that look smooth on top but are quite choppy below. And uh, so that's what we do. Uh, An analogy that I just came up with and I think we're going to use Many people remember a picture of a prism where a beam of white light comes in one end and the rainbow of colors come out the other end. And the way to think about it is when you're laser focused like that beam of light as an entrepreneur and you get to that liquidity moment where you sell the business like the prism, what comes out is a rainbow of challenges. They look beautiful. They seem great. But in fact, each of those colors is a new challenge that you've never dealt with before, whether it's the personal and uh, restoring family ties or thinking about your legacy or your community impact or your own health, which is very important, or the financial, which is how do you become a competent wealth preserver when you've been a wealth creator and learning about all the things that Jonathan, you know so well about asset allocation and what's the role of diversification and uh, what are the pitfalls of investing. And I think that's really the snapshot that we're going to use now for understanding Tiger. We're the prism through which that moment 
of extraordinary success gets processed and all of a sudden there's an explosion of colors of responsibility uh, that people want to grapple with. And if there's one place that's best focused on that moment, it's Tiger 21. I, I love that. You know, I, I, I always found you to be a curious soul. And I think it's, I think the origins of Tiger, I think you were a former Vistage member and the origins of Tiger sort of came out of that. And that innate curiosity about learning, lifelong learning, is what it takes for a lot of Tiger One, tw Tiger Twenty One members to really get the most out of it, and I think the diversity, not just of the chairs but the members, really adds a lot to to that experience. And I, I'm just um, fascinated how that's come together, and um, curious how you how you've seen families transform and the, you know, the, the challenges and opportunities and circumstances that they come into Tiger thinking that it's one thing and then getting something totally else out of it. You know, we used to say that investors sign up, but people show up. And um, at, at the very, very beginning, we thought this was simply about how to maximize the wealth that you've created and not foolishly invested in ways that, uh, take on too much exposure and too little risk-adjusted returns. But it turns out that uh, the reason why I love this new image of the prism is that's not the only color that comes out of a liquidity event. What happens all of a sudden is to people who are watching you, they think you've gone from one period of success to another. But if you're in it, it's an amazing roller coaster ride because all of a sudden people start looking at you differently your thoughts about your children now come often into much more focus because uh, there's this wealth that they're going to have to deal with. And most of our members are, their number one concern besides the preservation of wealth is how not to have it impact negatively on their children if they have children. And what are the types of activities that um, members can engage in to use the wealth that they've created in the most positive way for their children's development. Because we all know the stories of the ne'er-do-wells who were spoiled and inherited money and didn't amount to anything. And that's sort of one of the most important fears and one of the topics that's most discussed uh, among Tiger members. The Born Rich film I remember on HBO about that, that yep. the Johnson kids. 21, their birthday, they got a uh, billion dollar, a <laughs> billion dollars lopped into their uh, checking account. It was pretty fascinating. Anyway, uh, let's talk about your, your concept. We've talked about this. I always love this. I love your take on this, the 2% rule, which, you know, the rule for sustainability, calm, clear thinking is, you know, that, that I, I love that because it creates an environment where people can make better decisions. But you wrote in short that those living on less than 2% of their net worth each year are quite literally likely to be in a safe zone, while those living above 2% could be in the yellow zone. And some advisors may find 2% overly conservative. You know, maybe you could just sure. give me your take on how that, how that came about and your perspective on that. You know, I think in any discussion like this, we're talking about a very small subset of people who are lucky enough to have created significant or even vast wealth. And when children inherit the beginnings of what they will ultimately inherit, they very often uh, have very little concept of what can I spend? What's the relationship between what I should be spending money on and all this money I have? Uh, very often they get a trust statement and the, or some kind of uh, balance sheet. And it's almost unintelligible. There's 30 lines of assets that they really are not sure what each of those means or how the different asset classes work, but they know they have a, a number. And obviously I'm assuming that the financials are well-prepared by qualified people so that there's real meat on the bone of the financials. But if you're a young person and you know that you are now, quote, worth $5 million or $10 million or $50 million, pick any number you want. 
inevitably the question is how do i how do i handle that and what we've observed among tiger members and tiger members today have just passed the billion and a 150 billion dollar mark wow. and uh, today is a special day i think either today or tomorrow we will admit our 1300th member wow. around the globe um, and um uh, so the question is, you know, what's prudent? And this isn't just about kids. It's a similar calculation for members who've been working and having businesses generate lots of income, and now they sell it, and they just have a, a pool of capital. And the 2% rule basically says, if you limit your expenditures to 2%, you're not likely to go wrong. Obviously, if you don't make a penny on the rest of your assets, you can live for 50 years because 2% times uh, 50 years. But it's a, a much more profound notion that um, if you ask young people and sometimes old people, you inherited a million dollars, how much can you spend a year? You get the craziest answers. You can't believe how people who otherwise are intelligent will say, oh, I could spend 100000 a year or 200000 a year. And it doesn't take too much to realize that if you're spending 10% or 20%, the money's going to last five or six or seven or eight years. And, you know, frankly, I know examples where people have inherited money that if they had simply prudently spent at the 2% level, the money would have lasted them for a lifetime, but because they've been irresponsible or at least not particularly thoughtful about it, or made lots of excuses why they needed to spend the money faster, they wake up one day and are shocked that it's gone not too many years after they inherited it. So 2% is the safe zone. Obviously, it's a little tied to interest rates. With higher interest rates, maybe you can earn a little more and spend a little more. And uh, if you have forms of assets like pension funds uh, that increase your relative returns, then you can also spend a little more but in the absence of anything other than knowing you've inherited X dollars, 2% is the safe zone that you want to aspire to. I love that. And, and in fact, I, I've, I've been in the financial planning world for the last you know, several decades. I can tell you um, absolutely that it doesn't matter whether someone has $100 million or a million dollars. That concept applies to everyone in retirement. Thinking about themselves like an endowment is how I've always framed it because you know, you're not rich if you have 100 million and you spend 10 million a year, but you are rich if you have a million and you spend 20,000 a year. You know, you you, right. you you have a lot more freedom. It's kind of amazing. Um, yeah. Anyway, you've said, I remember you saying something about like what in the end, it's all those dreamers among us that will keep the American dream alive for all of us. What is the American dream to you? you you've, that's, you've had an inspirational idea about this, particularly from your own roots and your own journey, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, the American dream is, is a fantastic concept. I'm not sure how relevant it is to how many of our citizens these days, because we've, we've lost a bit of it. One of the things is uh, at the core is a notion of whether the United States is exceptional in any way. And we could debate the pluses and minuses, but in my mind, one of the most extraordinary things was I enjoyed an, a really excellent success as a young entrepreneur in my first project. It was a real estate project that happened to be then the largest commercial real estate project of its type in the country, which I thought at 25 was the natural order of things. And then I realized I was a lot luckier than I had understood. But the American dream said you can dream as big as you want and doesn't mean you're going to achieve it, but you have the right to pursue it and you might just achieve it. And uh, in my early 30s, as I traveled around the world, what was most amazing to many people I met was not my success, but that we have a society in which one can succeed at the level I had succeeded. And that's a fundamental difference. Many societies, no matter how successful you are, uh, you can achieve. Now, of course, there are many issues with success, and we have uh, not only the polarization that is uh, at the heart of a 
concern about American future. Uh, we have climate change, which um, some would say is a reflection of the excesses uh, and lack of responsibility of capital and particularly the oil and gas companies. But the bottom line is that today, America is still a place to a greater degree than most other countries where you can start with an amazing idea uh, and pursue your dreams under the rule of law and in a society where you have more freedoms than many. There's no absolutes anymore, but when you still add it up, I do think we uh, represent a kind of ideal around the world. And one of the reasons immigration is such a powerfully divisive issue is how many people still want to come to the United States because of the opportunity that it has. So I'd say the dream is a little tattered, but it's still fundamentally there. And I continue to be incredibly proud about the best parts of our country and concerned about the worst. And you're, and you yourself, I mean, you, you keep, you set a dream, you accomplish it, you create a new dream, you accomplish it, you create a new dream. Like, you know, as you, as you've been taken on, you, you mentioned the issue of climate change. I love the project you're working on with Muse. You, you know, you've, you've accumulated success beyond probably what you imagined as a child. And now you're like, okay, what next? You could easily, you know, just relax and just, you know, coast the rest of your life, but you want to dig in and you've devoted your time, money, and energy to dig into this climate thing. Maybe you could talk a little bit about it because I know you're passionate about it and, I, and I'm, I'm excited to see how it unfolds because, you know, to think that you can use your resources to make an impact in the world in the way that you are is, is a beautiful thing. So I, I'd love to hear a little sure. more about it. You know, I'm lucky enough to be part of a small but growing community of people who are not only concerned about climate change, but have the resources and the values to be fighting it with every means available because we won't win unless we uh, approach it that way. And what that means is philanthropically, uh, politically, and financially. My politics are not single issue, but dominated by uh, people who understand climate and are willing to make the changes uh, philanthropically by uh, looking at institutions around the world, uh, pr primarily educational, but not only, uh, that are teaching people about climate and what the solutions could be. Uh, recently, I was very proud to name the Goldman Sonnenfeld School of uh, sustainability and climate change at Ben Gurion University in Israel, and the uh, environmental law clinic at Yale Law School. We endowed as the uh, Goldman Sonnenfeld Environmental Clinic, and I'm most active at MIT, where I'm a co-chairman of the Path uh, Climate Pathway Project with uh, Professor John Sturman, where we have the model that is uh, generally credited as perhaps the best visualization of climate. Anybody can go to it. It's at En-ROADS, E-N-R-O-A-D-S. It's, uh, it's on the web. It's open source. And then investing in venture capital in firms that will decarbonize or reduce the methane. Uh, and um, I'm mentioning these three different approaches because they're very compatible and one builds on the other. The knowledge we get at the top institutions helps shape our agenda of where we want to invest. And uh, the knowledge we get at those top institutions help us inform politicians who are really searching for answers in the best of circumstance. But the science, it can be daunting and it takes a real uh, group. So I'm very proud to have built a team of seven incredible, mostly young people at Muse Climate Partners. My company name is Muse my initials are MWS. So I just took the letter W and replaced it with two U's and it's Muse Climate Partners. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the summer where most people have woken up to understand that uh, something is changing. People don't quite understand the trajectory we're on or the intensity, but between the floods, the hurricanes and the fires, 
uh, people are starting to realize climate change is increasingly going to be at the center uh, of all of our concerns. With more, yeah, I mean, what, we had more hundred day, hundred degree days in this country than I think ever before. It's kind of amazing. So, well, I, I applaud your efforts, and and I, um, yeah, it's it's inspiring to see someone get involved and dig in at all levels that you're you're thinking about it rather than singularly. It's 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 inspiring. Um, it's something that you you know when you're involved in something, you probably you know leap out of bed to figure out is there another thing I can do you know, another angle I can take to make an impact. It's cool. But thinking about that, you know, I, uh, brings me to the idea of many high input individuals. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of tiger members that are so that have such a heavy work ethic, you know, work so hard. And, um, how do you approach the concept of enoughness? Um, what I mean is, you know, the fulfillment in your accomplishment, without falling into the, 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 the perpetual cycle of striving without being able to strive and enjoy, strive and enjoy. Because there was an article I saw about Elon Musk's productivity hack, you know, taking two to three days off a year, working seven days a week, getting six hours of sleep a night is, is plenty, you know? So it's like, really yeah. interesting. I mean, like, yeah, work ethic's good, but you know, finding the right balance is, is, is also important to be able to rest and recover. I imagine. Yeah. You know, if you imagine being in World War II and wondering what you could do for the war effort, you still need to sleep and you still need to eat, but you might be motivated to spend more time on helping the war effort than in, quote, normal times, uh, even though you need to have some balance between family life and uh, health and uh, communal life and business. Um, I would say that... Uh, I have a kind of fundamental belief that each of us is given a gift to maximize who we are and hopefully for the benefit of others uh, to a certain degree. And um, we are, we're in a war with climate change now. And it's an issue that will not singularly, but it will, it with other issues like uh, the threats to democracy and weapons of mass destruction. There are a handful of issues, another pandemic that, you know, threaten the future of future generations. And um, we can't all be working on the same thing. Uh, I, I know that if I don't take care of myself physically, uh, I won't be able to do anything. So health is an important concern. Um, and uh, I try and uh, stay on top of that and, you know, exercise and eat well and so forth. Um, and I do have some hobbies that, you know, command my attention. Uh, but increasingly, uh, when I think about the meaning of my life, the gift I've been given to have an impact on climate and maybe inspire others to get more involved and collectively more. One of the nice things about our system is we're making venture capital investments and to the extent we're successful, we will attract more capital, which will allow us to have a bigger impact on uh, this issue, which I believe is a defining issue. The challenge is that even today, many people do not see it as the central challenge because it's a exponentially escalating uh, phenomenon and humans don't have the intellectual capacity innately to understand exponential phenomenon. I'll just give one example. Yeah. If you look at Wembley Stadium in London, it's 435 feet tall. And if you say, I put one drop of water in the stadium the first day and two drops of water the second uh, and four the third and eight, you know, each day you're doubling the amount of drops. It takes only 48 days to fill the stadium with water. It's kind yeah. of amazing. That's yeah. the power of compounding. Yeah. But what I think is more important is on the 38th day, the water is still underneath your ankles. And most people say, oh, well, I know the water is getting worse. But what they don't realize in an exponential phenomenon, in 10 more days, the water will go, in, go from being below your ankles to above the 435 foot tall uh, wall. And climate is similarly, we're, we're at the time where the water is below our ankles right now. We see it, we feel it, but we don't really conceive 
of what the exponential scaling is and the destruction that it will begin. And of course, we hope that the things we're doing to face it, particularly building renewables, fortunately, solar installations are also scaling exponentially. And until we know which is going to grow faster, but we know we have a hell of a job ahead of us uh, and uh, we better get cracking. Well, I appreciate your involvement and I hope that, uh, or I would encourage you, because I, I think that you've been a little shy about this, but I would encourage you to to educate your 1,300 Tiger members on the work that you're doing and, and, and the latest, because a lot has to do with education. You know, the people don't, people may be too busy in their lives or too busy in their daily routines that they're not even consciously aware of their even micro impacts that they're having in climate. So whatever you could do to continue to push that message and share your latest findings and even actions, micro actions that people could take in their own lives. I think you can move the needle that uh, I'll add a fourth, fourth element to your, uh, to your pronged approach of making an impact in the world. Um, because if you can educate those 1300 members, then they can educate their family and friends. It's, it's, I think that your uh, ability to be able to have an invisible impact, uh, will, 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 have that same exponential impact in, in my you. view. So um, anyway, before you started this, you wrote a book about Think Bigger, which I, re I really enjoyed actually. And uh, you shared several uh, stories about accomplishments of successful entrepreneurs. Um, I know this is kind of a trite concept of like, you know, what's one or two, you know, self-improvement hacks, but the idea uh, of this podcast was to talk about things that people can do and micro habits that help them not just in creating wealth, but in their wellness, their health and wisdom in their personal growth with, I, I, I think subliminally we're, we're touching on all of that in Tiger and maybe your own journal. I just wonder if you had one or two uh, little gimmicky hacks that you think, you know, meditation therapy, you know, you've, you've done some things that maybe touch on your ability to be able to see things clearer in slow motion. Maybe it's the uh, Japanese uh, experience that you've had over the years. Yeah. You know, the, the two that come to mind is I am both a meditator. Uh, I try and meditate 45 minutes a day. As a practical matter, it's four times a week, five times a week. Uh, and I'm, I've been in analysis for uh, analysis or therapy of one sort or another for most of my adult life. And both are ways to uncover the hidden patterns in one's life that are holding you back, but you don't even realize it. You have kind of behaviors that you say, where did that come from? And um, although sometimes uh, particularly therapy is medical in a nature, for me, it's a really extraordinary way to uh, explore the inner psyche uh, and the subconscious and get in touch with who I am and you know, you, you walk into a room and uh, you could be insecure because everybody looks better or seems more successful or funnier. And if you can be aware, the Buddhists have a term of a sort of a, a, a comprehending mind, a, a mind that is both watching what you're doing as you're doing it. If you can be aware that you're feeling that insecurity it tends to go away. If you're not conscious of it, it tends to drive your behavior in counterproductive ways. Uh, I think the other thing that is overwhelming for me is mentors. Um, I've, I've been glad uh, in, in my book, one of the chapters is on mentors. And uh, increasingly, I can't take credit, but increasingly I hear other talking about the importance of mentors. You know, if you take a hundred people who are uh, in any field and you use any reasonable ma metric to determine success. It doesn't have to be money. It could be articles published or, you know, eyeballs on uh, their uh, uh, podcast. Uh, you take any group and line them up from the most successful to least successful. The 50 that are most successful will overwhelmingly have had mentors and the 50 that are least successful will overwhelmingly have excuses for why they didn't have mentors. And there's just no substitute in life for learning from somebody who wants to share with you their experiences, because then you're levering on their back and the person who they, whose back they levered on 
and on and on and on. And I would say the greatest gift I was able to afford myself was having a handful of mentors over, uh, over the course of my career, uh, even today. And, and, uh, that's, that's anybody who doesn't have a mentor, just, you need somebody who can give you an objective viewpoint of either your behavior or how to make sense of the world. And, uh, I think if I had learned that one thing in business school, I could have got rest of all, I could have gotten rid of all the rest because that alone uh, could take you to extraordinary levels of success. Well, I, I have to thank you for being a mentor to me. And, and one of the best words that you've shared that I use constantly to, because you're, when you're a mentor, you're, you're hoping someone sees your blind spots and, and your, your word that, that, uh, that I, that I love is how to approach someone in a carefrontational way. When you see something that they're doing that is not well, how can you say it in a you know? Sometimes it comes across as constructive criticism, but you're saying it because you care about them and you want them to grow, you want them to learn and, and develop. Um, anyway, we're out of time. This has been an absolute pleasure. But let let uh, let people know where they can connect with you, where they can learn about Muse uh, Climate Partners or Tiger Twenty One social media websites, well, you know, sure. podcasts. Or- uh, we're all over all of those. Tiger Twenty One is www.tiger21.com. And Muse Climate Partners uh, is www.musemuusclimate.com. Uh, and uh, I'm always reachable at either. Uh, I'm uh, michael at muse.com. Uh, will get to me, M-I-C-H-A-E-L at M-U-U-S.com. Cool. Love feedback, comments, and if I can be helpful, it's always my pleasure. You're 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 awesome, and you've been gracious with the time, and uh, I'm just excited to see you know the the the, the decades ahead of how things unfold. Um, so signing off, subscribe uh, free to Wisdom, Wealth, and Wellness anywhere you get your podcast or on YouTube, and all links are in the show notes and at satovsky.com backslash podcast. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Satovsky Asset Management, hyper-personalized wealth management that has created joy and abundance since 2007.